know, at home, the pain over injustice, things weren't true, the things were being done, and in the world, people were doing things for crazy reasons. I turned away from that basis for belief and turned more and more towards the science, the evidence, the stuff you could see, touch, taste, feel, measure. But my personal relationship with God didn't die so easily. You see, while I had come to the conclusion that Judaism had no better claim to truth than Christianity or Islam, we all agree that there's a God and there must be something beyond this life, beyond this moral reality. So with these convictions, my faith in God and in our personal relationship it survived and grew. Then one day, my sister returned from college. She's almost five years older than me, so I was about 13 years old at the time. And I was talking to her about how God had to exist, because the existence of the universe without a creator was simply inconceivable. Furthermore, there had to be something beyond this life, because the idea that we exist, and then we just disappear into nothingness, was beyond horror. It wasn't horror. It, too, was simply inconceivable to me. I couldn't conceive it. Then my free-thinking sister had just come back from college. And for the irony of the story, you should know that today she's a devout Messianic Jew who's built her life around the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. My at the time free-thinking sister <laughs> <laughs> challenged my belief in God and in an afterlife with devastating logic. She simply said, so, just because you can't conceive of something, that something can't exist. <laughs> I was devastated. Of course, there were many things I couldn't understand or conceive of, like the nature of God or how he created the world. Does that mean that God didn't exist or didn't create the world? Just because I couldn't conceive of a universe existing without God, did that mean that a universe without God could not exist? Did my ability to conceive of things determine what is? Of course not. How grandiose. Nonsense. So I was screwed. <laughs> How can I believe in a God who stood above all else, especially in my personal relationship with him, for reality, truth, and reason, when that very reality and reason showed me that I had no more basis for such a belief than those Christians did in their imaginary God? I was in trouble. But, God and I were still carrying on a very personal relationship. We were still on speaking terms. And I must note this. Today, I know that this is strange. <laughs> but back then, it's curious to me today that at that time, it did not seem strange to me that he, God, did all the knowing. He was the source of infinite compassion, wisdom, and understanding. And I did all the talking. <laughs> he never said a word. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, I can remember the conversation with God in which I told him, and I'm still doing all the talking, that I could no longer believe in him. To believe in him would be to violate all of the principles of truth and reason upon which our relationship had been built. I said goodbye, and I was crying as I said this. But note that we were still on speaking terms. I was saying goodbye to him who I didn't believe in. <laughs> I did say goodbye to him, and I was crying over the loss of something that felt quite real. So I'd say that our relationship ended a strange phase. You know, relationships have phases. Well, mine and God's went into a strange phase in which I longed for, and I repeatedly asked him to give me some reason to be able to believe, a sign, please. How could you not exist? Just help me believe, I would say, over and over again. But still, I found that I was doing all the talking. <laughs> and at, at this point, I started to feel like there was something fishy about that in our relationship. <laughs> it was now a very troubled relationship. Well, let's leave my relationship with God in that troubled agnostic state in which I remained for decades. It didn't go away and it didn't resolve and turned to what I was learning about science, reason, and logic, which I totally believed in, and thought God did too if he existed, but he wouldn't give me a sign. <laughs> I learned that some of the greatest mysteries were yielded with the scientific knowledge and inquiry. And around the same time that I learned about the extent of anti-Semitism 
and the Nazi murder of six million people because of the, they committed the heinous crime of being like me. I also learned about a Jew who many considered the greatest genius of all time, Albert Einstein, my new hero. <laughs> Einstein had peered deeply into the nature of reality and had come away with some rather inconceivable and hard to understand notions about how the universe is constructed. You can take pieces of a pebble or a rock and break them apart into pebbles. You take the pebbles and break them apart into sand. You can take the sand and crush it into dust. You can take the dust and divide it up into little tiny pieces until you can't even see them anymore and then you get down to things called molecules. Take the molecules, atoms, the atoms, you can further subdivide the protons and neutrons. And the protons you can get further into quarks, etc., etc., etc. But Einstein, in his struggle to understand the fundamental nature of things, of, of the stuff of the universe, of whatever it is that's is underlying or is the stuff that we see and, and feel and touch, he came to the conclusion that these particles were not particles like we think of at all, like pebbles and rocks and billiard balls. They weren't particles like that. The stuff we could touch or feel with mass and shape was not of a different substance, said Einstein, or this other stuff called energy, like heat, electricity, and light, E equals mc squared. That's what that equation is about. Energy and mass were simply two forms of matter and could actually be converted from one to the other. The hard stuff we touch and feel could be changed into energy and vice versa. And that's what happens when a nuclear explosion occurs in which a very small amount of mass is converted into an enormous amount of energy. And you really got to get a feel for what that means. For example, let me try to give you a feel for it. See this dollar bill here? If I could just, just take this dollar bill and snap my fingers and convert it into energy in an instant, kingdoms would disappear. That's the exact, almost the exact amount of power that was unleashed in the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. 21 kilotons of energy. But inside this little dollar bill, 21,000 tons. Well, let's, let's try to take a look and see what that means. See the tower? And there's a big wad of TNT up there. Can the people in the back see it? Can, can you see it? You stand up or you can hold it up. Can I hold it up like this? Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, I can do that. This is a tower that they built with 50 tons of TNT. That's a lot of TNT. Let's see what happens with 50 tons of TNT. <laughs> Explosion. Much smaller than a nuclear explosion. You can see the trees where the devastation, where the, the bomb blast went off. The trees are just gone. Here is an infrared. So that's 50 tons of TNT. Well, let's see now. The bomb they dropped on the side. Whereas 21,000 tons, that's what's in this dollar bill, and that's 50, that's 420. Build that tower, build another one next to it, another one next to it, put 420 towers like that, 420 explosions, set them all off at once, and that's what was dropped on another side. That was just a tiny little, tiny little bomb, and that's all right here in the matter, in the mass of this one little dollar bill. It's all condensed and structured into something with mass, shape, texture.